don't know me. Know how I earn a living. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than three thousand bucks, Chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, Charge. We've got a panel on our hands on the fourth of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. again in the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be episode 44, the Brody Kitchen Calendar Contest. What is that all about? We are going to discuss that. Yes, the Brody Kitchen Calendar. Is it 1971 or 1974? As we discussed in the last episode, episode 43, the Brody Kitchen has a calendar hanging on the wall. What year is it? There was some speculation it might be 1971 or 1974. What details did we find out about this calendar while conducting our investigation? We're going to get to that in this episode. And we have a exciting a contest, a first for the Jaws Obsession. We have a contest, a giveaway contest that will be announced at the end of this episode. So listen to the details that we talk about in episode 44. So we're going to have a giveaway and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's like one of those old radio shows here. But before we get into that, we're going to get to some emails. And uh, of course, we have a Book of Quint update. What is this? Here it is. Ready? That is, I'm holding in my hands right now an actual hardcover edition of the Book of Quint. I drove down to New Jersey yesterday, went to Lightning Press, book printing, and they had the proof copies. So this is the proof uh, that I have to go through one more time. And if this is the final chance to make any last minute corrections before they do the limited run. The book just looks beautiful. I'm so impressed with their work. And it has a a black vellum cloth cover, hard cover, silver foil stamping of the Book of Quint logo on the front. It looks like a old time novel that you would pull off the shelf at at an old bookstore in New England somewhere. We even have a natural color paper that was used to have a good presentation. Very exciting. Very exciting to actually be holding this in my hands. And uh, I have about two maybe two days tops to get through this. If there's any other uh, last minute corrections or errors, I'm going to have to amend the files and then be in contact with uh, Debbie down in at Lightning Press. And um, she's going to be working with me in order to adjust anything that might be corrected. That's to stay on schedule because we want to get the run started so we can have the books to mail out to the backers in time for Christmas. To do that, we'd have to get these before or around Thanksgiving. So that's why this we're we're down to the we're down to the pinch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a photo update, take a nice picture of the book, send it out to the campaign backers to all their email. If you haven't backed the campaign, you can also see this. It's also going to be on Uh, jawsob.com on the notes page. I try to put all the updates on the notes page over at jawsob.com. You can also go still follow the links to the indiegogo.com book of Quint page, even though it is not, even though the campaign has closed, 
you can still view the updates there and you can read along as as we're getting the most current information because I am sharing this with the backers and trying to keep everybody on the same page as the developments increase. This is all exciting. This is all happening in live time. As as you're hearing this, this is all what's happening. Every day is something new. There's, there's constant work going on in order to get this pushed forward. I have a few emails here. Adrian wrote in, Hello, Ryan. Thanks very much for all that you are doing for Jaws and Jaws fans around the world. As you say, we have always known that this is a great people movie that just happens to have a monster shark in it. To be able to explore and examine this in slow time is a real treat. I I agree, Adrian. It is. It is a real treat. And it's episodes like this where I've learned something new about Jaws. And it's episodes like this and, and emails from the listeners that kind of push the Jaws obsession in a direction. And then I learned something completely new, which, which I'm going to share with you all when we talk about the Brody kitchen calendar. We would not be able to do this if we didn't slow down and actually examine the greatest movie of all time and, and, and take our time and look at this. I agree that that was a really important comment by Adrian that um, it is a real treat to slow the movie down and actually enjoy the details that are going on inside it. So Adrian continues. He says, just a quick question. I really enjoyed the way you located the place and date of Quint's birth. However, I have always wondered how convincing Robert Shaw's American accent is to an American. Does he really sound like an Amity fisherman would sound? Although I lived in the U.S. for a few years as an English-born English speaker, it's very difficult for me to gauge how authentic his American slash New England English sounds to someone who worked or grew up there. I know long-serving sailors pick up a strange accent drawn from the hundreds of people they meet and places they stop at. And I suspect that Robert Shaw did a very good impression of that. But as we know, it's often the smallest details that make the difference. As I say, just interested in what you think. Best wishes and thanks again, Adrian from London, UK. Adrian, thank you so much for writing in. That's that's a great, great email. And that is almost a, that's a whole episode in itself which I'm going to have to put on the list because I don't think I'm alone in this. When I was younger and I watched Jaws, I never even thought Robert Shaw, I thought he was an American actor. I didn't even know, I I did not know the details about Robert Shaw. So I only knew him as Quint. And I could not believe when, 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 as I got, as I got older and started enjoying other works by Robert Shaw, that he had a, a British accent. And it was unbelievable because to me, that Quint accent that he uses is purely New England, but it's New England, but you can't quite place it because like you said, and it's very true, like Adrian pointed out that long, long serving sailors pick up a strange accent drawn from the hundreds of people they meet in places they stop at. Um, I remember working with uh, older, older fishermen and people that came from Long Island or the New England area or Boston. I'm from upstate New York, so I have an upstate New York accent. There's a downstate New York accent. There's all these different accents for the regions of this area. And if you were to have someone that moved around a lot and was all over the world, he would have a a little different accent than the others around him. And I think the Jaws movie has a lot to do... Accents have a lot to do with the telling of characters, some of the backgrounds of the characters, uh, it, because accents play a very important part. Even you have Martin and Ellen Brody kind of playing off of the in Amity you say Yad and and all that at the beginning of the movie. So there's already a, a kind of an accent undertone, the awareness of accents in the movie. So when you see, when we're introduced to Quint, he does not sound like the other Islanders. If you listen to Bad Hat Harry, that's pretty much what an Islander would sound like. What's interesting is the mayor, who is an Islander, does not have that accent. So now we can deduce that the mayor spent time away from Amity when he, and when he was younger. So he left and then he came back after a period of time. So he lost a bit of that accent. I just think that's really interesting that you picked up on that because Robert Shaw is flawless. He has a, a little bit of a tinge of Irish and Boston in there. It's just great. Everything's great. It's just, uh, but there's the the Americans in there, and he's got the, uh, but the American accent is in there, and he's got the baritone, he's got the growl, so like the lower the lower register going. I for the longest time did not know he was British. 
that that was for <laughs> for like my complete childhood. It was just mind blowing to hear him talk outside, like on a talk show, like on the Dick Cavett show or something. It was just wow, that's him. Wow, okay. Now, so that's why I consider Robert Shaw. Um, performance of Quint to be the best character performance of all time. And I explained that in one of the other episodes. Uh, it might be in a Ben in the episode what what he was uh, what Adrian was referring to when we isolated uh, Quint's age. He was referring to episode 24, how old is Quint? That's where we um, that's where I broke down all the clues of the areas and the dialogue in jaws to find out where Quint hailed from most likely where Quint hailed from, but also his age. I might have mentioned it in that, and I'll say it again right now, is that I do believe that Robert Shaw's portrayal of Quint is the best character performance of all time in defining a character performance is when an actor completely modifies who he is. Most of the times you see actors, they will play, their best role will be playing themselves. So the personality of the of the that's closest to them, it's like, oh wow, he was so natural because he was playing himself. For example, if you like Nick Nolte, Nick Nolte's best performance is when he's a really disgruntled, grumbly man because he probably is in real life a disgruntled, grumbly man. I'm sorry, Mr. Nolte, if that's not true, but that is uh, that how I see it. But the character performance is when you you're out of your original self. Two quick examples is Johnny Depp and Edward Scissorhands, and then you have uh, Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Both completely stepped outside of themselves and became another persona, and that's what Robert Shaw did here with Quint. And why is it the greatest of all time? Because it's the most well known. It goes generations of all countries worldwide, and that's uh, that's why I think that. In my estimation, Robert Shaw as Quint edges out Marlon Brando as Don Corleone in The Godfather. I can go into that too. That's probably another episode. We're not going to go that deep into it, but that's what I believe. It was a very, very good accent, and he convinced me for the longest time, and I did not know until I started watching other Robert Shaw movies, like Force 10 from Navarone, where he's with Harrison Ford, and you can and then you can, actually, um, you can actually experience what Robert Shaw really is like. What was the other one? What was the other one where he was on the subway? To Pelham, Pelham, right? Uh, taking of Pelham 123, 1974. So if you listen to Robert Shaw's, uh, that's, his, that's his real voice there. And it's completely different from what he does with Jaws. And that was actually released in the same year. I don't know. I, I thought he made Pelham 123 before Jaws. Oh, then you have Lonigan in The Sting, of course. Why, why, I mean, just it's just unbelievable that he can he can jump in all these characters and then he's Quint, and there he is. He's completely convincing. So, uh, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for writing in. Thanks for highlighting that. We're gonna, maybe I'm going to have to organize a uh, a, an accent analysis of Jaws. That would be pretty interesting to get into. So, thanks for writing in, Adrian. Uh, John K writes in from also from the UK. We have a lot of a lot of downloads of the show is in Great Britain, UK. There's a huge following there, and uh, of Jaws, a lot of Jaws fans because. As Jaws is an American film, it's also uh, shares, it's a British film as well because it has arguably one of their greatest actors of all time, Robert Shaw, in his greatest performance of all time. We share with England like this, uh, there's an American-English relationship going on, American-British relationship going on with Jaws. And uh, I remember uh, Mike Currid of the Eggertown Tour Company telling me that a lot of the people that come over, a, a lot of his tour clients, when he takes them on the Amity Island tour over on Martha's Vineyard, that they are uh, British. Even though the American fans outnumber, like our, our you can watch our downloads when, every time I release an episode, you can see the American downloads are, are it's, a, it's a big chunk, but the next biggest chunk always is Great Britain. So um, John writes in, hi, Ryan, I'm wondering if you plan to release any official merchandise. I've got the original Jaws poster, which is framed on my wall, and a book of Quint poster would go perfectly with it. Keep up the great work, John in UK. Thanks, John. Thanks for writing in. As far as the merchandise goes, I actually had a conversation with John Tedder, our orca specialist who runs Quint's Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com, and I don't see why we can't. There's going to be stuff coming in the future it's just that we have to, uh, the, the book has to, I have to get the book stage done first. Then we're going to be toying around with merchandise. Why not? I mean, we already have stickers. Uh, why not? It's a great logo. It uses John's Orca font that he created. He created that Orca font by hand. 
And then I modified um, Quint on the pulpit to match up with that. It really came out nice. And that's why I chose it. It's kind of a, it's a good branding. And that's why I chose it to go for the cover of the book for now. This is, remember, these are the limited edition printing that I need to take this book now. I'm going to have to reach out to agents for representation of the Book of Quinn in order to, to walk it into major publishing houses in hopes that it gets a, a wider publication. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm sure we will. I'm sure John Tedder and I will work something out via his Quint Shark and Shack with Book of Quint merchandise. That would be really cool. That's a great idea. Stay tuned with that. Thanks for writing in John K. from the UK. Let's get into the Brody Kitchen calendar. Mom, I got cut. I got hit by a vampire. You guys are playing on those swings. Those swings are dangerous. Stay off there. I haven't yeah. fixed them yet. I think you're going to live. It's not the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life. So that's the scene between about six minutes and five seconds to six minutes, 18 seconds in the movie Jaws, where young Michael Brody comes in with the bloody hand and you see uh, the calendar hanging on the on the left side of the screen. If you look at the uh, if you look at the title card for this broadcast that's on Spotify or or if you go to JawsOB.com and you look at the episode section, I always have the title cards on each episode. You'll actually see I'm going to isolate that frame and use that for the title card. So, yeah, that's the scene that features it. And honestly, and also the calendar makes another appearance when you have uh, uh, the dinner scene with Martin Brody and young Sean Brody. And Ellen is against the door frame, and then she goes to answer the door. Matt Hooper comes into the house. You see the calendar hanging in the back wall there. That's that's where what we're talking about. That that would have been around 38 minutes into the movie. That's the scene we're talking about when we're discussing the Brody Kitchen calendar. Phil wrote in on the last show, Phil from Superior, Colorado, wrote in about uh, that he was in the IMAX theater and it appeared that the woven hanging calendar with a bird on it in the Brody Kitchen, it, he believed it was the year 1971, went into this whole investigation. Phil was not the first. We've actually, uh, John received through his uh, social media, uh, remember, John is on orcarebuild.com, and he's also at Quince Shark and Shack at Etsy.com. But if you go to uh, the links in the description of this broadcast, you'll always see John Tedder's social media down in the description of this broadcast on whatever platform you're on. So if you follow him over to his Instagram, his YouTube page for Orca Rebuild, y you'll see that he has bigger followings, and um, people will toss questions to him as well. And he'll try to answer those as best. And he was fielding a couple of these where people believed after the IMAX release, they said that calendar says 1971. Before we get into that answer, what we discovered, we got to talk about what that calendar actually is. What that calendar actually is, is a tea towel, T-E-A, T -E -A, T like an like a English breakfast tea. It's a tea towel. Well, what are tea towels and how can you use them? Um, I went to the spruce.com. I'm going to put this article on our show notes. Everybody, the show notes are going to be uh, important this uh, for this episode because I'm going to be putting a lot of photos up there of details and articles and descriptions about what I'm going to talk about here. What are tea towels and how can you use them? So this article over at thespruce.com by Mary Marlowe Leverett. You may know them as dish towels, but tea towels have a history all on their own. Uh, walk into a gift shop anywhere in the United States and you'll find plenty of tea towels printed with images and witty sayings. Tea towels make a perfect souvenir because they are easy to pack for friends and they make a practical gift for the kitchen or bathroom. What a tea towel is. The term tea towel came into fashion during the 18th century when households would use the towels often made from finely woven linen fibers while serving tea to catch the occasional drip. Historically, they would also be used to carefully dry fine china to prevent scratches. Today, they are defined as flat weave dish towels that measure approximately 16 inches by 28 inches to 18 inches by 30 inches. Very rectangular. So um, uh, the, the, the article goes on to say different uses of tea towels. Uh, she lists 13 different uses. And one of them is art to hang on the wall because you can have really nice designs. I had to do a, a deep dive using um, information that John was sending me. And what I found out is that that, uh, that specific towel is a 1974 Jean Clabet tea towel. Now, who is Jean Clabet? Let's, let's look at that. Let's look who Jean Clabet is. Charles Eugene Clabet was born in 1907. He, he was active and lived in Maine. He was known for marine paintings and as an illustrator. He primarily worked in watercolor 
although some of his paintings have been reproduced as fine art prints. His subject matter is usually a marine landscape with one or more sailing ships. Yes, Jean Clebet lived to 1985 in uh, Bristol, Maine. So he was an artist that lived in Bristol, Maine. And he did a lot of different, uh, he did watercolors, he did, uh, he did a lot of different art. But one, Jean uh, Clebet, K-L-E-B-E, if you look on um, our show notes, I'm going to show you that he was, he was exceptional with uh, wildlife drawings and art. And he did great. Uh, his birds were excellent, and uh, but it was mostly um, from Maine. That, so he had that uh, coastal uh, boats in a harbor. But a very talented artist. Uh, there are no coincidences in the Jaws obsession. And I was doing some research on Jean Clebet, uh, trying to find any information ab- about this gentleman. So he lived in Maine, and there is a magazine called Down East. It's still around today. It's the magazine of Maine, and it's all about, um, it's a vacation guide, calendar events for the state of Maine. It's called Down East. Well, in the July 1968 edition of Down East magazine, there is an article, uh, Jean Clebet, Maine artist by Lou Dietz. And in the same magazine, as you scroll down, it, this, this, this site just lists the articles and what's, what's in the magazine. In the same magazine is also an article called My Mother and the Giant Wedge-Shaped Man-Eating Shark by Alvin R.L. Dome. How interesting is that, that in 1968, six years before uh, Jaws is filmed, that there is a Jean Clebet article as well as a giant man-eating shark article in the same magazine. And now we have Jean Clebet's uh, bird calendar tea towel uh, in a movie featuring a monster shark. So I think that's really interesting. Those are all little, uh, there are no coincidences in the Jaws obsession uh, what happens is is those are just little signs that all these themes intersect with each other at all times. I thought that was really special that I, I saw that. I'm going to highlight that and put that on our show notes. If I just thought that was a neat little off-ramp into other areas of thought while I was researching this tea towel. Those calendars were issued every year. I found one from a picture of one from 1967. So it's an actual uh, 1967 tea towel art with the Jean Clebet bird art on it, uh, calendar. So it's the same, it's a, so it's all the, that's the new calendar. So they would update it every year. Now, if you look at the details, these went on for a number of years. I, we've seen 1967. I have 1975. There's a 1971 for sure. And then of course we have 1974, which is featured in the movie Jaws. Um, if you go to the show notes, you'll see a self portrait of Mr. Clebet. You'll see, uh, some of his art there. And you're going to see various photos of different years of the Jean Clebet tea towels. You can see, and as you look at the detail, you're going to see the numbers, the font used for the date is actual, it's like an art. It's a, it's a, it's a little, it's like a design and it's not solid script. So that's going to come into play later on about this mystery of if it was a 71 or 74. So that's going to be on the show notes. So now we know who Jean Clebet is. We know it's a tea towel, and uh, that's the calendar, and it's used. it was used back then for uh, designs, and you could hang it on your wall. So to solve the mystery of if it was 71 or 74, I turned to our resident orca specialist, John Tedder. And John, of course, you know, when uh, in the Avengers, when, uh, they, when the Iron Man says, we have a Hulk, well, here on the Jaws Obsession, we have a John Tedder. And what happens is, is that he comes out with the most amazing information when you least expect it. So... I was talking to him on the phone and all of a sudden he goes, oh, I have that towel. And I said, what do you mean you have the towel? He goes, I, th- he goes, I have what I believe is the closest thing to that towel. And so he, what he has, he's taken some detailed, really detailed photos. He has a 1974 uh, Jean Clebet calendar bird towel that he purchased from a secondhand dealer from, that was from a yard sale where the seller insisted it was from her parents' house on Martha's Vineyard that sold in the early 2000s. The description that the seller was saying about her parents and the house, they all fit the Brody house pre-renovation. Remember, the Brody house has been renovated. So when you go to Martha's Vineyard and you see the Brody house, it looks nothing like what it was 
in 1974. It also fit the description of the age of the couple that owned the house during 1974's filming of Jaws. So this is the so this is where uh, John's 1974 Jean Clabet tea towel comes from. It also has the wooden dowel in the top, and it's folded over, and it has the hanger. So you, this is how it would have hung on the wall, just like the Brody house art that you see in the movie. But John stresses there's still no way of knowing without a Polaroid or some super accurate photo that he can actually compare. There's no way of knowing 100% if this is a, the screen-used Jean Bay bird art tea towel that's used in Jaws. If you look at the tea towel that John has, photos of it are going to be on our show notes. It's pretty close. It's And also, it shows the sign of aging because the towel is made from fine linen and uh, John's towel is... And it's yellowed from uh, age, where, where linen stays out in the air, especially a salt air, and it's going to turn brownish over age. So this thing was hanging around for a while. Whereas if you look at some of these other photos of the ones you see on the internet that are maybe folded or they were put in a drawer or maybe they were in a plastic bag, so they were kept safe from the elements, they are now they are still very white. So John's towel shows that aging sign. But what's interesting is if you zoom in on the digits, zoom in on the numbers, the the one and the four, okay, have a similar straight down column. And then the four, that art that's used, it's not a solid number four. It's a it's almost a mosaic or dot art that uses the slash over to make the digit four. Now, when you see it in IMAX, or if you see this in the movie theater, and I'm going to put a screenshot of uh, from the DVD, if there is a slightly out of focus lens at the theater, or if you or if something is not as crisp, you can actually see that does look like a one. But if you look at the HD uh, 4K, we had Dale from England emailed in. Uh, a super 4K detail of the uh, calendar, as well as we have the John calendar, you can actually see that it would have been a number four. Um, John also sent over a Blu-ray screen screen grab where it's enhanced. We're to, we're, we went total CSI on this. We used uh, Dale's image from England. We used uh, John uh, John's real evidence. So we went total CSI, and we totally would, now we have proven the one on the wall is a four. You just have it's just because of the way those digits are drawn. There, it's a it's a fine paint that if it's slightly out of focus, and remember this was filmed on thirty five millimeter, probably Kodak stock back in nineteen seventy four. The film was not as uh, crisp as it could be today if you were using thirty five millimeter film today. So. What happens is is you lose that slash over with the background because it's in the background. So it looks like a one, but it really is a four. And um, I think I invite everybody over to the show notes to see our evidence and to show that it definitely is a 1974 calendar. And now there should be a, a big run on uh, ant- on eBay antique 1974 Jean Clabet bird art tea towels for all you serious Jaws fans out there with your collections. How many of you have one of those hanging on your wall? Uh, now you're going to need one. See, so that's what the Jaws Obsession does. If just when you think you're coming out, we pull you back in. That's what we do here on the Jaws Obsession. <laughs> okay, so so let's get to the let's get to the big contest. Let's get to the big contest. The big contest here is we're going to do a giveaway. We are going to do a giveaway courtesy of uh, John Tedder and Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. You can follow the links in the description of the show. Uh, John has offered a care package. What he has are uh, a lot of little knickknacks, Jaws uh, stickers, cards, and really cool stuff John has over there that are for the serious Jaws fan. And he's going to mail you, the winner of this contest, he's going to mail you a care package courtesy of Quint Shark and Shack at Etsy.com. Um, for the first person that emails into me over here at the Jaws Obsession at JawsOB2025 at gmail.com, the first listener. That emails in all six species of bird that are on the Brody Kitchen calendar, the Brody Kitchen tea towel. If you look at our show notes, but 
you're going to also have to dig around the internet. The first person to get all six species of bird, email to me at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. First person, I will let you know that you are the winner. Then you just send me your address, and John will fire off a, a Quince Shark and Shack Jaws Obsession care package to you. What fun. What fun. That's how we get into the Jaws Obsession. We go right in. How about that? And then we'll reveal the answers on the next episode, episode 45. Always great to see this. Always great to have you here. This is There's a lot of things going on. I hope to have a very big special announcement on the next episode because I'm going to be back here on Tuesday with some updated information with uh, episode 45. Thank you for listening this week. Now that we all know the great mystery has been solved, it is a 1974 calendar, so that proves that it is definitely is 1974 when Jaws takes place. And now we all know about Gene Clabet's wonderful art and those wonderful tea towels he was doing in the late 60s into the mid-70s. Thank you very much for listening. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired, I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago, where it's got right to my head. Wherever I may roam, but I'll land or see your home. So now get those uh, emails going, uh, excluding family and friends. They're, you're il- ineligible. All listeners, if you can email in the six species of bird on the Brody Kitchen Tea Towel Calendar, you're going to win a prize. Courtesy of John Tedder and Quint Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. Thank you very much for listening this week. Be sure to comment, share, su- subscribe to whatever platform you're listening on. Those comments and those uh, five-star reviews really help us, especially over on iTunes. If you're over there on Apple Podcasts, uh, the, the good reviews really help us push the word out. Same with Spotify. Thank you, everyone, for listening, for your support. We have a lot of exciting news going on, um, and it's uh, it's just exciting to actually be able to hold the book of Quint in my hands and it's coming so thank you very much for listening this week farewell and adieu and show me the way to go home <laughs>